For millions of Christians all over the world, this must certainly be the most unusual Easter Sunday that we've ever had in our lifetime. And ironically, at a time when we celebrate that incredible event known as the resurrection, when Jesus Christ made his miraculous and dramatic exit out of the place that he was locked down in for three days and three nights, here we are in lockdown ourselves, unable to get out. Well, thankfully, that is not stopping us from gathering together through the means of technology to celebrate the fact that Christ is risen and that he has defeated sin, death and Satan once and for all. Of course, Jesus was not locked down against his will. And it wasn't that it took him three days to get out either. He could have come out the tomb immediately if he'd wanted to. It was just that the third day was the day that he had determined, even before the world was created, as the day he would rise from the dead and declare his victory over the grave. Now, I know many of us invited friends and family who aren't normally at church to join us online today. And so if there are those who are watching who responded to such an invite, I want to personally invite you or welcome you, sorry, for coming here on behalf of Community Bible Church and say that we're so thankful that you're spending this time with us wherever you are in New Zealand or in the world. Our desire during our time this morning is to celebrate all that God has done through the life, death and resurrection of Christ and also to share that hope with as many as are willing to listen so thanks for tuning in if you're not used to going to church or listening to these things please take the time to consider what we are talking about this morning and please make contact if there's any way we can help or if you have any questions about god christianity or anything we talk about in the live stream today there are links on our website communitybiblechurch.org.nz and also in the youtube video description Now, if you have a Bible with you, please turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 11. If you don't have a Bible, remember, of course, that you can look it up online if you're on a computer or watching on a phone. You could try our website, blueletterbible.org, and you can just type in the reference, blueletterbible.org. And if you type in John 11 in the search bar, it will bring it up for you. Now, we're going to be looking mainly this morning at verses 25 to 27, but I'm going to read the first 45 verses of the chapter first so we can get the context, and then we'll look in a little deeper at verses 25 to 27. So reading from John chapter 11, from verse 1, it says, Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary, who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. So when Jesus came, he found that he'd already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, and these are the verses we'll be focusing on, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. 
Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, The teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She's going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind have also kept this man from dying? Then Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench, for he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did, believed in him. What an incredible story. And of course, it's not just a story. It is also history. God Almighty really did walk this earth just over 2,000 years ago, in the human form of Jesus Christ. Jesus did really have some friends named Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Lazarus did really die, and Jesus really did bring him back to life. You know what I always find so hilarious about this account? Is that the Pharisees, Jesus's main opposition was so mad that he raised Lazarus from the dead guess what they decide to do well the answer is in the next chapter chapter 12 where it says in verses 10 to 11 but the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also because on account of him many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus can you believe it they were so mad that Jesus brought Lazarus back to life they develop a scheme to try and kill him again I don't think that they learned their lesson Now, technically, Lazarus was actually resuscitated by Jesus rather than resurrected. Yes, he was miraculously brought back to life after being dead for four days. And in the King James, it says after four days, he stinketh. But he wasn't given his new heavenly body at that point, something which is yet future for believers. And so this meant that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was the first incidence of an actual resurrection because Jesus was in his new heavenly body when he later rose from the dead. So we're going to focus now on verses 25 to 27 of chapter 11. And here we find Jesus talking to Martha, who's a little confused by what Jesus has been saying. She says she does believe Lazarus will rise from the dead one day in verse 24. And in saying that, she was referring to the future resurrection. However, it appears that she hadn't quite got it, that Jesus was meaning he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead now, today, at this very moment, in an incredible demonstration of his power over life and death. And we see in verse 21 that Martha believed Jesus could have prevented the death of Lazarus if he was there earlier, but it reads as though she didn't think it was possible now he'd already died. Though to her credit, she does say in verse 22 that she believed whatever He asked of God, God would give it to him. So let's read again what Jesus says in his response to Martha's words. In verse 25 there, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the son of God who is coming to the world. 
And then she goes on from there to get Mary. And shortly after that, as we read just before, Jesus raises, La- raises Lazarus from the dead. Now, let's remember that at the time Jesus spoke these words in this passage in John 11, Jesus hadn't yet died himself. He hadn't yet been mocked and scourged and now to a Roman cross, but he knew this was coming. In fact, Jesus told his disciples on multiple occasions he was going to die and not just that, but also he was going to rise from the dead after three days. So Jesus knew what was coming and what was about to happen with Lazarus was just a foretaste of that. So again, verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Now, the critics of Jesus would say that while he walked the earth, He made some outrageous claims, and there is some truth to that. He claimed that he came from heaven. He claimed he could heal the sick. He claimed he had power over death. He claimed that he was not just God's son, but God himself in human form. And they indeed are outrageous claims, but only on one condition. And that is, if they were false claims. However, if they were true, which they were, then they're not outrageous at all. And even the greatest of God's critics would likely agree that if God was really who he says he is, all-powerful, all-knowing, the creator of the universe, then if he came to earth in a human body, it would make complete sense that he could do anything and everything because he is God. Though we would probably not expect him to serve and suffer and lay his life down for others as he did. Now, if we were God on earth, we might handle things a little bit differently. We might use the powers for our own good. Now, above all other things, it was his claim to be God that caused the Pharisees to seek to take his life. And from an earthly perspective, that is why he was crucified for being so blasphemous in their eyes to make himself one with God. Now, if Jesus was just a religious teacher who acknowledged God but didn't claim to be God, he wouldn't have got anywhere near as much opposition and they probably wouldn't have crucified him. Look again in verse 25. And consider what Jesus is saying. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. He's saying here that he alone has the power over life and death. What a statement. He's saying, I am the resurrection. What a claim. Now, if we back up to the beginning of the verse, we see why it makes sense that this statement is not so outrageous after all. And that's if we acknowledge who is actually saying it. And as we see, the one speaking is Jesus. Jesus was the son of God. But he was also God the Son. As it says in John's Gospel, in chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning, the Word. Speaking of Jesus, pre-incarnate. And a little further down in verse 14 of John 1, it says, And the Word became flesh. That which was God became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the first point that needs to be acknowledged here then is this. Jesus is God in human form, 100% God, 100% man. And that is who is speaking to Martha here. Jesus is God in human form, 100% God, 100% man. Not a religious teacher, not a fanatic, not a spiritual guru, but God in the flesh. How can this be? Well, God did this to bridge the gap between God and man, to make it possible for man to gain a solution to his greatest problem that we'll be looking at shortly. And also, Jesus was speaking here to grieving friends who he cared about and who had lost their loved one, Lazarus. Jesus' words were full of love and compassion, proclaiming the most comforting truth they could ever hear, that death was not the end. Jesus' tears were real when it says there, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept, not because he felt helpless or hopeless, but because he had compassion on those who were grieving. Jesus proclaimed that death was not the end. Is that not a comfort? Think of what an enemy death is and what destruction it causes in our lives. Think of the thousands and thousands of people who are grieving all over the world right now because a loved one died in the last 24 hours from something or some cause. Because of what Jesus came to earth to do, death does not have to be the end. Now, the sobering truth is death is not really the end for anyone because every single person is going to live forever. But having said that, not every single person is going to live forever in eternity with God. 
Only those who've placed their trust in him for salvation. And we'll see why shortly. So the raising of Lazarus from the dead was actually the last miracle Jesus performed on the earth before he would go and be killed and then rise again from the dead. Again, it was a taste of what was to come. And Jesus, out of his mercy and grace, shows them tangibly that he had power over death. Now, this greatly strengthened the faith of Jesus' disciples seeing this happen. And it gave them more confidence that there was life after death. In fact, Jesus had so much power over death that he had to say specifically, Lazarus, come forth. You know why? Because otherwise, everybody in the graveyard would have come out. Now, in Jesus' statement here, he was saying that for a believer, death is not the end. Though they may die, they will live again. This means for a believer that their last breath on earth is also their first breath in heaven. Now, we believe this as Christians, and it causes some people to think we've lost our minds at times. There's no doubt about that. Now, 26 years ago, when I was playing in a rock band in Los Angeles with long hair, earrings, and a drink and drug habit, I would have said you were out of your mind if you'd have told me in 26 years' time I'd be preaching from the Bible on Easter Sunday. But God changes lives, and he can change yours too. So back to our passage, it's true that Jesus made outrageously exclusive statements, but he could do this because he was God in the flesh. So another point to make here then is this. Jesus has exclusive power over all life and all death. Jesus has exclusive power over all life and all death. He proved this with Lazarus, and in an ultimate sense, he proved it himself when he rose from the dead after being dead and buried for three days. Now, another seemingly outrageous claim Jesus made, except it wasn't because it was true, was that he had the power over his own life and death. Who else can say that? And even if they could, who else has ever proven that? In John 10, 17 to 18, Jesus said, Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. Who's in control there? He then says, No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I've received from my father. When being challenged by Pilate, Jesus reminded him if he wanted to, he could have had tens of thousands of angels come down from heaven and rescue him. But he didn't because he was there for a purpose. Now, no one else on earth can make this claim that they're in control of their own life and death. And this should make us perk up our ears because death is everyone's enemy. Now, it's better to tell people the truth than to make them feel good about themselves. And here's a profound truth that every person on this planet needs to embrace. Are you ready for it? We are all going to die, and none of us are in charge of when. We're all going to die, and none of us are in charge of when. What is happening in our world has been a big wake-up call to so many people that we have no control over our lives, and we have no control over our death. And so if you're not in charge of your death, doesn't it make sense that you make sure you are ready for when it happens. Now, one of the things people don't like about the Christian message of the gospel, which is the good news about Jesus Christ coming to earth to save sinners, is that it is an exclusive message. Well, that's true, but it's only because it is the truth. And to present it as just one of the ways to God, instead of the only way a person can be saved from their sin, would be to deny the very message you were presenting. I often use the analogy of an airplane. If you've flown before, you've been in a plane, and the pilot's bringing the plane into landing, most of us are quite glad that we're going to be on solid ground soon. But imagine if the pilot came across the airwaves and said, I don't want to be so narrow-minded and dogmatic to land on just that one runway that they've assigned to us. How about we just have an open mind and just land anywhere? That's a situation in which you appreciate narrow-mindedness, even being dogmatic, and specific and exclusive because it's for your own good and safety. So it is with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't claim he was the only way to God because he wanted to monopolize for the sake of it or because he had an ego problem. He said he was the only way because he is the only way to God. How do we know this? Because no one else is both God and man. No one else has brought themselves back from the dead as Jesus did. Now, let me explain for a moment why this was important, that Jesus was the only one who could truly give a man or a woman a way to come into a relationship with God and be forgiven of his or her sins. Firstly, the message of the gospel, which speaks of the person and work of Jesus Christ, is so often misunderstood. 
You may be listening now and think that you've heard it, but it's quite likely that you haven't, not accurately anyway. Wouldn't you agree that it's worth hearing at least once correctly before you decide to accept it or reject it? And I want you to know that there is a sincerity here in bringing you the truth. If you were sitting in a church right now, it can be a little bit more awkward to get up and walk out. And I recognize that watching on a computer, if you are sick of what I'm saying, all you need to do is click a button or swipe on your phone and woof, there I go. So I'm asking you to bear with me and hear these things and recognize that it's no coincidence that you are here right now listening. Well, this gospel all starts with God, of course, and whether you believe in the existence of God or not actually doesn't matter because in the first verse of the Bible, it simply says, in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1.1. And notice there's no attempt there to prove God's existence. It's just assumed in the beginning, God. Just look around you at the way in which this world is created. It's obvious. Look at the way that you are created. Again, it's obvious if we don't have any preconceived ideas. When you look at the intricacy of creation and how we are made, it's mind-blowing. Our heart beats consistently from the moment that we are conceived to the moment that we die. And no one knows how it starts. God is the one who starts and stops it. Now, the world has been created, so it has a creator. Your body is intricately designed and it has a designer. So here's the first truth of the gospel. God is real. God is real. Now, in addition to God being real, here's another truth about God. God is good. God is good. And that's not just good as we understand good, but good as in perfect. And of course, it'd have to be or he wouldn't be God. Now, God is perfectly loving he is good and perfectly loving meaning that he freely and selflessly gives himself to others for their benefit in 1 john 4 8 the bible tells us god is love god is perfectly loving but he's also perfectly just meaning that he's morally excellent perfect in judgment that he must exercise his judgment upon all that is evil In Deuteronomy 32, 4, it says, He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice. Righteousness, righteous and upright is he. So we know the truth about God, that he is real and that he is good. But we need to know the truth about ourselves also. Do you know what will happen to you after you die? Do you care? Many people say they don't care, but when it gets to that point, they care a lot more. Because God is perfect, heaven is also perfect where God dwells. Do you think you are good enough to go to heaven? Do you hope that your good outweighs your bad when it's all said and done? I was speaking to somebody recently who was saying that very thing. Here's a sobering reality. No one is good enough to go to heaven. And if you think about it, even if you are 99% good enough, That 1% that is bad would mess up heaven for everyone else. Why? Here's why. God's standard of what is good is summed up in the Ten Commandments. You know, have no other gods, do not lie, do not commit adultery, do not steal, etc. And these commandments reveal to us what perfection looks like. And we can never attain that perfection. How do we know? Have you ever lied? Have you ever stolen anything regardless of value? Have you ever put um, not put God first in your life? Remember, he's given you every heartbeat since before you were born. Every breath you are taking right now is because of him. The life you enjoy now, God is allowing you to have. But we push him out of our lives. We want to take control of our own lives. We want to think that we have the best plan for life. But God knows us better than we know ourselves. So we know the truth about God, but the sobering truth about us is this. We are morally corrupt and sinful. We have broken God's commandments. We've not lived up to the standard that he has set for us. And there's a purpose in the commandments. And it isn't to make us all good in our own works. It's to show us that we cannot measure up to God, that we all fall short and that we need help. It's actually a blessing for us. 
we are morally corrupt and sinful and i'm going to say by god's standards because that's not to say from a human perspective that you are not good i know many people who do not profess to be christians who are very good people very loving people very helpful people but it's a bit like if you had a flock of sheep and they were in a bright green paddock they would look very white but as soon as you put those sheep in a field of snow they don't look so white so the issue is how do we look according to god's standard not human standard in the bible in romans 3 23 it says for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of god and so there's a dilemma then and this is mankind's greatest problem because god is just it means he must punish sin what is sin sin is breaking god's commandments as i mentioned just now which all of us have done now we may not like to hear that truth but it is the truth the gospel truth it's a bit like a smoke detector that goes off to remind you that something is wrong and our conscience is like that and when we hear the gospel it can prick our conscience and and tell us the truth that we sometimes wrestle with that we know that we've sinned against god we know we've done wrong and the judge of all the earth god himself finds us guilty of breaking his commandments and therefore deserving of his punishment now listen carefully this is where the concept of hell comes in eternal punishment for sin is committed against the eternal god and we all understand justice because god has built it into our conscience if someone you loved was brutally hurt or even murdered and the the judge brought the criminal who did it before him and said i'm feeling very forgiven and loving i'm i'm a nice judge i'll let him go free your heart would cry out no justice needs to be served well god is the judge of all the earth perfectly loving perfectly just and the bible speaks about the justice of god in this way in the first part of romans 6 23 where it says the wages of sin is death punishment is what we rightly deserve it's what our sins have earned us but god created us to know him to be in a relationship with him and when our sins hinder that from a reality our lives are empty because the fact is life does not work without god now some of you might think well my life's working fine without god that's a perception without considering our eternity now the question that some may ask is but god can't just forgive us of our sins can't he just do that well not quite not without sin being punished just like with a human court but remember the great thing about this bad news of our condition and our guilty standing before god is there is good news so please don't tune out here i want you to hear the good news think about an earthly judge stepping down from his seat and taking the place of a criminal he just sentenced to death so that the criminal could go free well in a much greater sense that's exactly what god has done for us through jesus christ and it was only jesus christ who could sufficiently take our place because he was completely without sin god's love moved him to extend mercy and grace to lost sinners in a way that didn't deny his justice yet allowed him to express his infinite love and so that's the astounding reality of who jesus christ is and what he came to accomplish and it's this jesus that we are reading about here in john chapter 11 god himself became a man fully god fully human and then willingly lay down his life for guilty sinners taking our punishment because of his great love so the next important truth of the gospel to understand then is this and this is the great part god's great solution to man's greatest problem god's great solution to man's greatest problem and as we read in romans 6 23 for the wages of sin is death i read that earlier that's what we earn from our sin but the gift of god is eternal life in christ jesus our lord that's good news in 2 corinthians 5 21 we read those incredibly sobering and weighty words where it's speaking of jesus it says he made him who knew no sin who'd never sinned who'd never been around sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of god in him the full weight of god's wrath god's anger and righteous justice came crashing down upon his son as he hung upon the cross and that's why jesus cried out my god my god why have you forsaken me so god's great solution in christ looks something like this 
Firstly, Jesus was God in the flesh, fully God and fully man. Secondly, Jesus willingly offered himself as our substitute. Thirdly, Jesus took upon himself the wrath and judgment of God for our sins. And fourthly, Jesus rose from the dead, defeating sin and death and proving he was God. This is God's great solution. I'll read those again. Jesus was God in the flesh, fully God and fully man. Jesus willingly offered himself as our substitute. Jesus took upon himself the wrath and judgment of God for our sins. And Jesus rose from the dead, defeating sin and death and proving he was God. And today, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, we celebrate that last point as the confirming reality of the Christian faith. On Easter Sunday morning, the stone was found rolled away, a very heavy stone. And despite the Roman soldiers guarding the tomb, Jesus had risen from the dead. Death could no longer hold him down. If Jesus had stayed in the tomb, there would be no hope. And Jesus would have proven to be a fake Messiah. But Jesus didn't stay in the grave. He rose from the dead. Three days later, just like he told his disciples he would. And in doing so, he defeated the power of sin, death and Satan once for all just as it was predicted in the Old Testament. If you have some time later to look at Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah, part of the Dead Sea Scrolls, you read how specifically hundreds of years before Christ was crucified, it predicts his death. That's just one incidence of the incredible way that God predicts history before it happens. Many, many Jewish people have come to know Christ through reading that. The Gospels record that Jesus was dead not breathing, a blooded corpse, but on the Sunday he appeared with a new type of body that could disappear and appear. But the body wasn't a ghost. It could go through walls, but it could be touched and eat a meal. And after spending time with his disciples, those disciples then bore witness to the fact that Jesus rose from the dead and paid for it with their lives. You wouldn't do that for a lie. You wouldn't do that to cover up for some religious fanatic that had an ego problem. So how can we have proof that Jesus rose from the dead? Well, we don't have time to go into all of the details here. The first proof is that the Bible teaches us and tells us that. But let me give you six other reasons why we can know that Jesus rose from the dead. Firstly, the historical evidence of the empty tomb. That was a massive, massive stone that took three men to roll down into place, let alone move. Secondly, the historical evidence of the appearances. Over 500 people seeing Jesus when he rose from the dead. Thirdly, the historical evidence of changed lives from that moment right up to today. Thousands of years. Number four, the historical evidence of Jesus' predictions, as I spoke about in Isaiah and many other places in the Bible. Number five, the historical evidence of the Old Testament predictions, other predictions in the Old Testament. And number six, the lack of any compelling counter evidence. So six reasons, the historical evidence of the empty tomb, the historical evidence of the appearances, the historical evidence of changed lives, the historical evidence of Jesus's predictions, the historical evidence of the Old Testament predictions, and the lack of any compelling evidence to the contrary. You can see why the resurrection is important. And so in light of these things we've been talking about, let me ask you a question. What is the single most important piece of information that any human being could ever hear during the span of their physical existence on this earth? What is the single most important piece of information that any human being could ever hear during the span of their physical existence on this earth? Is it how to be healthy or how to be wealthy? Is it how to be smart, intelligent or wise? Is it how to be happy or how to be content? Is it how to make the most out of this life or how we can benefit the lives of others? Well, as you may have guessed, it is none of these things. What is it then? The most important piece of information that any human being could ever hear during the span of their physical existence on this earth is the next verse in John chapter 11, verse 26, which says this, Jesus speaking, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And that is followed by the most important question you will ever be asked in your life. Jesus says, do you believe this? Do you 
believe this. The gospel requires a response. It's not enough to just hear it, read it, know it, or verbalize it. We need to believe it. Martha got the answer right in the next verse, verse 27. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God, who is to come into the world. The gospel means good news. And it's the good news about who Jesus Christ is and why he came to earth, what he did and why. And so the reason why the good news of the gospel is the most important piece of information we could ever hear is because it's only through hearing about who Jesus Christ is and why he came to earth that a person can get right with God. And the truth is, every human being on this planet has a legitimate need to get right with God, whether they realize it or not. And that's where we come back to the issue of saying, I'm fine with my life as it is. It's because you don't realize that you're not right with God, your creator. And you need to get right with God. So what is the right response to the gospel then for a person to be forgiven of their sin, granted the hope of eternal life? I remember the feeling of just being forgiven of of the things I'd done wrong, just the regrets, the mistakes I've made in life and just... The, the slate wiped clean, a new start. What does God require of us to receive his mercy and forgiveness so we can be justified in his sight and declared not guilty? Well, we know from what we've looked at already that man cannot appease God in his own good works. Turning over a new leaf, being a moral person, saying sorry, trying to do better will achieve nothing in the eyes of God. Most of the religions in the world are based on this idea that it's what man has to do to get right with God or the gods to achieve some godlike status or sense of nirvana. But the message of the gospel that I'm proclaiming to you today is not like that at all. The message of the gospel is not about what man must do to get right with God. It's about what God has done to make it possible for man to get right with God. The message of the gospel is not about what man must do to get right with God. It's about what God has done to make it possible for man to get right with God. So what should our response be then? When we've been convicted of our sin against a holy God, when we recognize that we deserve his judgment, and when we desperately want to escape such a destiny as an eternal punishment, and we want to get right with God, well, the Bible makes it very clear for us through the words of Jesus as he began his ministry on earth when he said in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, and he said these words, repent and believe in the gospel repent and believe in the gospel and so we see the response required from sinful man by a holy god and this is the next point here is to turn from sin which is repentance by turning to god which is belief or faith that's the response required the only response required from sinful man to be reconciled to a holy god to be justified to be forgiven is to turn from sin, which is repentance, by turning to God, which is belief or faith. Repentance and belief are not two separate things that we have to do. They're two words that describe a singular response. Repentance speaks of the turning away from a life of unbelief, a life of sin, and from trusting in yourself as you're convicted of your sin. But your only hope of being able to do this from turning from trusting in your own good works is to, by faith, turn to God trusting only and completely in what Christ has done on your behalf. That is belief. And as a person repents and believes two components of a singular response, they are saved. Repentance speaks about a change of mind about yourself. It means you would hear the gospel like this and you would say, I think differently now. I realize I'm guilty before God, but you didn't realize it before. It involves a change of emotion as you feel bad about your sin and a change of will as you decide you want to get right with God the God you've offended and rejected. And this leads to a change in your actions as you initially place your trust in Christ, who is the only one who can deliver you from your sin. And this is a process that takes place all in the same time. And as you continue to believe in Christ as a new believer or a new convert, you continue to turn from sin to change. You're transformed from the inside out as the Holy Spirit helps to make you more and more like Jesus. So, Man doesn't do anything 
to gain his salvation. Man simply responds to what God has already done. And I can tell you that the multiple conversations I've had with people, that is the key thing that's misunderstood by so many people when they think they understand Christianity, they understand the gospel, is they don't realize that their own goodness will never get them there. And they don't realize that Christ fully took all of their punishment for their sin upon himself for them. It can be offensive to people to say, you mean none of my good works and all the things I do will get me to heaven? But again, it's true. It's not saying that you're not good from a human perspective, but your main concern is to be right with God. If you ask me, am I going to heaven? I would say absolutely 100%. And if you ask me why, don't expect to hear anything about me or my goodness, because I am not worthy. I know how flawed I am how I've sinned and rejected God in my life. My answer would be this. It's all what he has done. He is the reason I'm in heaven because he paid for my sin and I'm trusting not in myself, but I'm trusting in him. Trusting in Christ is often described in the same way as you would trust in a parachute if you were falling from the sky. You'd cling to it with every fiber of your being. You wouldn't just say, oh, it's an interesting parachute. I kind of check it out every now and again. You know it's your only hope to escape death. In the same way, a genuine response from a genuine believer will involve a 180 degree turnabout in their life. So then we talk about the result then. The result of trusting in the gospel, of trusting in Christ. Well, here are some things. A new believer in Christ, as a result of trusting in Christ through repentance and faith, has been forgiven of all sin, past, present and future justified in the eyes of God he sees you as perfect because he sees you in Christ adopted into God's family you become a child of God granted eternal life you will live forever in heaven and you are called to a life of knowing loving and serving God I remember when I first got saved the, the feeling of knowing finally where I'd come from why I was here and where I was going all I'd ever wanted to know A new believer in Christ is forgiven of all sin. They are justified in the eyes of God. They're adopted into God's family. They're granted eternal life. And they're called to a life of knowing, loving, and serving God. So that to say, true saving faith will result in a transformed life. Gradually, it doesn't happen overnight, but there will be a transformed life. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone comes to Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Jesus doesn't improve your life. He gives you a new life. So as we sum this up, it's been my hope and prayer that every person who hears this message today will respond in one of either two ways. Either you'll say, thank you, God, for saving me because you're already a child of God and you know that you're in a right relationship with God. Or it's my prayer that you'll say, dear God, please save me because you acknowledge that you're not right with God that you cannot save yourself and you now wish to get right and respond to God in the way that I've explained I'm thankful that I don't have to try to save or convert anyone that's God's job I just have to be faithful to proclaim this message I'm proclaiming to you and I know that the Holy Spirit of God will work in your heart and convict you you won't feel guilty about your sin because I'm saying anything it'll be God in his love Bring it to your attention because he's wooing you to himself. 26 years ago, I heard this message. I'd probably heard it before, but it didn't really sink in. And I wasn't really interested. But in God's timing, I heard the good news of the gospel. I became acutely aware of my sin and unworthiness before God. I was living life to please myself. I was caught up in selfish ambition. I was playing in a band, involved in drugs, promiscuity, seeking to make myself great in the eyes of man but God humbled me his spirit convicted me and by his grace I turned from the sin that I had loved and embraced for so long and trusted by faith in the saving work of a carpenter's son who also happened to be God's son and was forgiven of all my sin and made into a child of God nothing to do with me everything to do with him So we've looked at the truth about God, the truth about ourselves, the great problem sinful man faces and the great solution God has provided through the death, burial and resurrection of Christ. All that is left is the matter of how you are personally going to respond. 
And I do hope and pray with all my heart, if you haven't already, that you would surrender to God. Turn from your sin by placing your trust in Christ alone and what he did for you upon the cross out of his immense love for you, that you would experience his forgiveness, his mercy, his grace in your life as he makes all things do new. And if you do, when that inevitable day comes, as it will for all of us, to die and leave this earth, Others who know the one in whom we were trusting will say this about us as they did about Lazarus. Though he died, yet he lives. Though she died, yet she lives. Because your last breath on earth will be your first breath in heaven. Two final points here then. Firstly, Jesus promises that those who believe in him will never truly die Jesus promises that those who believe in him will never truly die. But as we've just seen, the next point, we must respond personally to Christ's offer to be forgiven and granted eternal life. We must respond personally to Christ's offer to be forgiven and granted eternal life. Now, if you have any questions, and I respect difficult questions. I don't think that for some people they just hear something like this and immediately respond that can happen and we shouldn't delay but it's good that you look into these things because the bible can handle that now please reach out to us through our website or contact me directly if you're watching from our website there's a button on the front page that will give you more information about the gospel and if you do place your trust in christ as a result of hearing the gospel message that's been presented here today please let us know. We would love to pray for you, to give you a Bible if you need one and any other resources that might be helpful. And lastly, if you're maybe looking for something to do this afternoon on Easter Sunday that's relevant, there's an excellent movie called The Case for Christ. You can find it on iTunes or Amazon. And it details the story of a man who started out, the true story of a man who started out to disprove the reality of the resurrection of Christ. But in his journey to do that, he became thoroughly convinced that it did happen and his life was transformed as a result. It's called The Case for Christ. Again, thank you so much for tuning in wherever you are. I know we have people around New Zealand. I know we have people in other countries. It's so appreciated. And um, for the children, if you filled in your answers, the answers to your questions are now being typed up and you can check if you got them right and if you got them all right i reckon your mum and dad should give you a treat i'm going to get in trouble for that now anyway i'm going to pray now and then we're going to sing one more song um, led by jason and his family please join me in prayer father we thank you for your word we thank you for the incredible reality of the resurrection and we thank you for the hope that it brings us a living hope an everlasting hope. And I do pray for every person listening to these words right now that is not in a relationship with you, that is not right with you, that they would be convicted of their sin and that they would turn from that sin by trusting in you for salvation. Please, Lord, may they experience the blessings of forgiveness, of new life, the incredible things that you have in store for those who trust in you. May people find hope, Lord. And we thank you for the hope that we have in Christ, in Jesus' precious name. Amen.